Hello and welcome to the latest episode of This Week in British History with me, Philippa Lacey Brule. If you love British history, then you are definitely in the right place. This is episode 40. That means we've done this for 40 weeks so far. Um, this Week in British History is once a week for 2020, so beginning at the start, well, end of December, start of January at the beginning of this year, and I'm going to be going through right till the end of December 2020, rounding up historical events which happened in British history in those weeks. So although that's the way it's packaged up, they all stand alone as interesting episodes, so please feel free to go back and have a look. They're all in the playlist this week in British history, so you can just put the playlist on and uh, and let it roll if you so wish. If you can't wait um, a week between episodes, then please also do come and find me on Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest. This week we have the first forced abdication of a King of England, that of Richard II. We had the first coronation of a Queen Regnant, Mary I, and the birth of Richard III. Thank you to those who've already donated to this channel to help me make more free content during this year, 2020, when I can't operate my business. It's much appreciated, and those of you who've made the donation will be finding a thank you coming in the post to you very shortly, if not already. If you'd like to donate, please follow the link at the bottom of the screen or in the show notes. In doing the preparation on the story of the abdication of Richard II and the coronation of Mary I, I realised that those two stories are going to be absolutely plenty for one episode. So I will just mention the birth of Richard III as we cover Richard III in many other episodes, um, especially around the Battle of Bosworth. He was born on the 2nd of October 1452 at Fotheringay Castle in Northamptonshire. On the 29th of September 1399, Richard II became the first English monarch to abdicate. Now, Richard II is the boy king of peasants revolt fame. He first quelled and then absolutely quashed the peasants revolt of 1381. The revolt had been in response to a poll tax, which we covered in episode 22. And the uprising was against the king's councillors. The king was only 14 at the time. He'd been king since the age of 10. And so the rule of the country had been taken by a council. And so the peasants' revolt were looking for particular councillors who they blamed for these new rules. And so those in the peasants' revolt didn't have an issue with the king himself, but with the councillors. Richard was seen as either an innocent or just not responsible for the hardships of the people during the time. Richard was seen as a ray of hope. That is how he initially quelled the revolt. And like I say, you can watch this in episode 22, but effectively he, um, he promised them that they would be listened to, that they would get what they wanted, that he was their leader, he would be their, their lord and sovereign, and so they could look to him. However, he then brutally quashed the peasants or the people who had um, risen up against him. Many were hung and those that survived were told that they would never be able to rise up against him again, and indeed they didn't. So we saw from early on in Richard II's reign that he was very willing to quash anyone who was going to rise up against him. Now, being a peasant and disagreeing with the king was one thing. Being a noble and disagreeing with the king was going to turn out to be just as dangerous. Now, Richard had grown up with a view that God had appointed him, anointed him, and God would protect him. His success in quelling the peasants' revolt was just further evidence to Richard that God was on his side, that he was doing God's work and God would protect him whatever he did. This seed of self-belief turned into a tyrant's belief that nobody should disagree with him. As Richard's minority came to an end, he began replacing old councillors with his new friends. Nothing surprising there, except they weren't very good at the job of leading the country. In 1386, the council had failed to adequately react to the threat of invasion from France. The old councillors saw this as the final straw. A delegation led by Richard's uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, went to Parliament for support to go to Richard and tell him that he needed to rid himself of these useless councillors. Richard's reaction was to accuse his uncle of treason. But his uncle's reaction back was, remember your great-grandfather, Edward II. That was a very thinly veiled threat, for Edward II had died in custody in Barclay Castle. Although Richard did carry out the wishes of the Duke of Gloucester and the other nobles, he secretly met 
with a group of judges to push a new treason law which would make disagreeing with him a crime punishable by death. This left those who wanted checks and balances on Richard's behaviour with no choice but to pit themselves against the king. Richard's cousin, the battle-experienced Henry Bolingbroke, heir to the Duchy of Lancaster, was forced to take sides. Now he had no love lost for Richard's favourites, especially a man called de Vere, and so Henry sided against the king. De Vere's forces were no match for those of Henry Bolingbroke and the king had to admit defeat. Now the nobles had to decide what to do about Richard. Five of them met Richard at the Tower of London. They included Henry Bolingbroke, Richard's cousin, his uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, and then Arundel, Warwick and Norfolk. For three days, they debated what to do about him and Richard was left wondering his fate. Eventually, they decided the best course of action was to declare fealty to Richard. So this was the first chance that the nobles had had of deposing Richard, but it didn't happen this time. They instead swore fealty to him. And as Dan Jones um, writes, this is probably due to it just being the least worst option. They would have been aware that had they deposed Richard, civil war would have broken out over who should take his place. Now, all seemed to be going fine, but there's one indication that Richard was planning for the future, and that was that he was building up his own private army. This was not an army that required funding or approval from Parliament. This was Richard's privately funded army. So they had no loyalty to anyone except Richard. They all wore the White Hart badge. And in the Wilton Diptych, which is a altarpiece commissioned by Richard, housed in the National Gallery, you can see that the angels watching the Virgin Mary and Jesus give their blessing to Richard are also all wearing the White Hart badge. Now, perhaps Richard amassing a private army was just his form of an insurance policy against something like what happened in the Tower of London happening again. But in 1394, Richard's wife, Anne of Bohemia, dies. Now, she seems to be, have been some sort of quelling influence on Richard. He was distraught and his behaviour from now on just became more and more tyrannical. There is a portrait of Richard II from this time, the first portrait of a monarch to be painted from life. And it is in Westminster Abbey, near to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And he is depicted on a throne, high above everyone else. And this is actually the kind of thing that Richard started to do. He had a high throne where he could look down over everyone in the room. If his gaze was upon you, you were expected to throw yourself to the ground prostrate. In 1397, Richard reinstates the treason laws. It is now punishable by death for you to disagree with the king. It had been 10 years since the five nobles had held Richard in the Tower of London while they decided what to do with him. And now he decided to seek revenge. Warwick, Gloucester and Arundel were all arrested. Mowbray was made Gloucester's jailer and torturer. The treason trial of Warwick, Gloucester and Arundel was to take place at Westminster Hall, but Gloucester could not stand trial. Mowbray reported back to the court that he had died in custody. Not surprising for the amount of torture that he'd undergone. But luckily for Richard, he'd given a full confession before death, admitting to all of the charges that were laid against him. Henry Bolingbroke, the fifth man from the Tower of London at this point, had the choice, side with Richard or follow the fate of the others. Henry testified against Arundel and Warwick. Arundel was put to death and Warwick was banished for life. Now only Henry Bolingbroke and Mowbray remained from the original five and a paranoid fueled argument only three months later had them back in front of the king. The king said, well, I don't know which one of you is telling the truth, so I'm going to banish you both. Mowbray was banished for life, Henry for 10 years. Now all five of the leading nobles were out of Richard's way and Richard set about making sure that none of the others would be able to rise up against him again. They were forced to put their seal on blank pieces of parchment. Cunning move from Richard because he could now write on there whatever he wanted. In 1399 there are two key incidents which show Richard's overreach. The first one was the death of the Duke of Lancaster. At this point Henry Bolingbroke should have become into his inheritance. 
he should now be the Duke of Lancaster with all the lands and property uh, that went with that title. However, Richard claimed it for the crown. Now this undermined the right to property and inheritance in England. The second thing Richard did was he went over to Ireland to extend his influence over there. That gave Henry two perfect excuses to come back to England. Henry Bolingbroke now had nothing to lose and that makes a powerful enemy. But Richard had also created a situation where the rest of his nobles and landowners had everything to lose and they now had a leader. People flocked to Henry's cause and Richard's White Hart army was no match for them. Richard had no choice but to surrender. He was imprisoned in the Tower of London and on the 29th of September 1399 he abdicated his throne. The following day, the 30th of September, Henry Bolingbroke claimed the throne of England for himself in English, which was the first time since the Norman Conquest. Henry Bolingbroke was now Henry IV and although following that story you can see that there was little choice really but to get rid of the tyrannical Richard II, it set a dangerous precedent for from now on anyone with royal blood with a claim to the throne could overthrow an anointed king. On the 1st of October 1533 Mary I was crowned at Westminster Abbey. This was the first coronation of a female monarch in her own right so she was a queen regnant as opposed to a queen regent who would be queen by virtue of being married to the king. Mary was ruling in her own right. She was the daughter of Henry VIII by his first wife Catherine of Aragon and she had succeeded, well actually technically she succeeded Queen Jane who had become a queen after Edward VI's death earlier in the year but as we know Queen Jane didn't last uh, long enough between the death of Edward VI and the proclamation of Mary as Queen to do any real ruling of the country and she certainly didn't get a coronation. But Mary I did. So she is the first female monarch to be crowned at Westminster Abbey in her own right as Queen of England. The traditions and ceremony of an English coronation were followed but with a couple of interesting changes. In the run-up to a coronation the monarch would appoint new Knights of the Bath but as this required a ceremony including naked men, baths and the monarch, it wasn't deemed appropriate for Mary to take part. And so the Earl of Arundel, her new great master of the household, took part in the rituals on her behalf. But Mary created something of her own ritual. She called upon her council members to attend her at the Tower of London. She knelt before them and spoke at length about how she had come to be their queen about the duties that she saw that a king or queen had and about the obligations that her and her council had to God and to her people. She remained kneeling for the whole time and the most powerful men of the country were moved to tears. The coronation procession took place the day before the actual coronation ceremony. The streets had been lined with rushes and tapestries and rich cloths had been hung about. There were pageants planned and set along the route which was taken by the Queen and her huge entourage which included the Princess Elizabeth and Anne of Cleves. Sunday the 1st of October was the day of the coronation and Mary made her way from the Tower of London by river to Westminster Palace where she changed into her first set of robes for the day. At 11am Mary made her way down the blue cloth which had been laid from Westminster Hall to the high altar of Westminster Abbey. She was preceded by the bishops of Winchester, Norfolk and Arundel who held the orb, scepter and crown. She wore parliament robes of red velvet and walked under a canopy held by the barons of the chink ports. She was escorted to the coronation chair, the same one that is still in use today that you can see in Westminster Abbey and it was placed on top of a specially built platform. She was then taken to each of the four corners of the platform to be presented to the congregation. After prayers, she went behind a screen to the left of the high altar to change for the holiest part of the ceremony, the anointment with holy oil. Mary was concerned that none of this ceremony could be tainted and so the oils she had made for sure herself had come from Flanders. After that and back in her velvet robes, Mary sat on the coronation chair. She was presented with the spurs and a sword and was successively crowned with three crowns. The first one, that of Edward the Confessor. The second one, the Imperial Crown. And the third one, her own, which had been specially made for her. It was almost 5 p.m. when Mary, now dressed in purple velvet and wearing her crown, processed back from Westminster Abbey to Westminster Hall, now laid up for the coronation banquet. 
During the banquet, Mary's champion, Sir Edward Dimmock, carried out the tradition of throwing down the gauntlet to anyone who believed Mary not the true sovereign. This was a good start for Mary. The crowds had cheered, her nobles were loyal, but no one for a moment expected that Mary alone was enough. She now would need to find a husband. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of This Week in British History. Have a great week and I'll see you next time.